Hey guys. Um, good to see everyone out this morning, or I can't see you. Maybe it's good for you to see me. A um, few announcements. We are going to try to go back to our in the building services next week. Um, we would love, we strongly encourage you to f either fill out the survey on Facebook or call the office um, somewhere between uh, Monday and Wednesday between 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock if you'll call and let us know if, if you're coming or not coming. We need to have these numbers so we can know with all the new guidelines that we have and the spacing issues, we need to know uh, if we need to meet in the church, if we need to meet in the activity center, if we need to have both, if we need to have multiple services. Um, but we're not going to be able to fit everybody in like we have before because of the spacing issues. So please fill out those uh, surveys and don't assume that we know what you're going to do because we've got about 200 people that we need to know what they're going to be doing. So please fill it out or call up to the office and let us know if you're going to be coming back this coming week. And we would, we would just appreciate that so much. Also, we have some things, announcements that we've got to bring up. There will be no child care. There will be no nurseries, no Sunday school. Um, it'll just everything will, will be here for the worship services. Uh, and, and like I said, there will be no nursery, no child care. Um, also, bathroom is limited. Uh, so if you can go before you come, please go before you come. Um, because we have to, we can only allow one person in the bathroom at a time, and then we have to clean between uh, uses. Even though we have multiple stalls in our bathroom, that's the, the regulations that we have. So, if you can go beforehand, please go beforehand. Volunteers, when we do the survey, if you're want, wanting to volunteer and help, we're going to need uh, a lot of volunteers in this next few weeks. Um, so if you were willing to volunteer, there's a list of things that we'll need help with on the survey. And if you just want to use, be used wherever, uh, just put on there. We'll use whatever. So if you're, we need volunteers, we're going to need, uh, people to make sure we're spacing. We're going to need people ushering. We're going to need door. I think we'll have our typical door security. We may need parking lot security and directions and depending on what we have going on there. So please, if you're able to volunteer, please volunteer. Uh, also recommendations are if you've been sick for the last 14 days, uh, do not come. Uh, if you have any underlying conditions, health conditions, they, they're asking you to stay home. We are going to keep uh, and continue our live Facebook live services. So you're not going to miss out if you have Facebook or even if you go to the, the website and you can go through langestreet.org and, and follow through there to, to Facebook and you can watch the services that way. Uh, but we do need our numbers so that we can know how to plan. We need them by Wednesday so that we can know what to do. We're, we're, we're working on sanitizing. We're working on uh, spacing and working on all these things. So let us know by Wednesday whether or not you're coming or not. I need to know one way or the other. Um, so keep all that up. We're going to have masks. We have 150 disposable masks here. Um, but we, we strongly encourage people to bring the mask. Um, and I know there's a lot of opposition to the mask and things, but just out of love, for each other, let's uh, for those that are uh, cautious, they're scared of the, the what's going on. Let's show love for those people, and I'll wear the mask until I get up to the pulpit. Um, not because I'm scared of it or anything, but I, I do it because of love and respect for for you guys. And so I want to be in compliance with with uh, with our government. But I most most of all, I just want to encourage you guys. Um, that I'm going to lead out in uh, wearing the mask until I get into the pulpit to preach. Um, so if you can do that, we we'll, we greatly appreciate it. And also keep on giving. We we the offerings have been good, um, but we you know we still have our bills that keep coming every week or every month. So thank you for giving. You got the online giving, 
And, and also the survey, you go to the Facebook page or you can go to www.langestreet.org and you can find the survey on there. And there's also the online giving on our website. So you can go on there and do your online giving or you can either bring it or mail it to the church here, uh, to the activity center. So we, we thank you guys for all that you have been doing and continue the work that we got. We've got a long way, ways to go. Um, and let's just, let's, let's forget about ourselves for this moment. Well, that's, I think that's a requirement that the Lord gives us to forget about ourselves and think about what's more expedient to reach out to other people. What's, uh, what, what's more expedient, what's the best thing to do to be in unity and to encourage and love each other. Because right now this is where we need to have the unity of the church that we're going to praise God even in submission to government regulations. So I thank you all for, for doing that. And please, I know I've said it already, please fill out the survey or call up to the church so that we can keep account of what's going on, uh, who's going to be here and who's not. Uh, all right. This morning we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at the uh, for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at a code of winning, winning conduct. And as you look at the, the theme of chapter 3 is a, a conduct, a way that we should live, not for salvation, but because of our salvation. And as a child of God, it should be our desire to win people for Christ. That's the purpose of our salvation and to bring glory to God. We're, if we're going to bring glory to God, we're going to do that by bringing people to Christ. And there is a way of living. And we've been seeing that through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we finished up uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. And now as we're going into chapter 3, we're seeing the code of conduct, the winning code of conduct. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a spouse winning conduct. And as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, we're going to find where Peter is talking to these people that they, uh, they have come to know Christ as their Savior, and their greatest mission is in their household. We think about, uh, we often think about mission work and evangelism. And we think about evangelism as going. And we think about a, a mission work as going into uh, places where they don't have the church or they don't have the gospel and they don't have uh, access to, to God's word. And we're going to go there and we're going to take the gospel there. But sometimes the most neglected place for evangelism is right in the place where you live. Right within the people that you have the closest relationship with. The people that you see every day. And so Peter begins this code of conduct, the code of winning, winning conduct with winning the spouse. Uh, in this time frame, as we were looking at and winning the spouse that we see, uh, it would have been very common as, as we look at the life of Peter and the, the writing of Peter, these are not second and third and fourth generation Christians. These are all, these people have come to know Christ in either their adult life, there's not a situation where they have been raised in church like so many of us have been raised in church. Uh, in my life, I was taken to church whenever, uh, from the time I was born, I was in church. My family raised me in church. My family was Christians. And, and then I put my faith in Christ, and I'm a Christian, a, a huge part because of what they did. But as you look at who Peter is writing to, these are mostly the Jewish people that have been converted to Christ, converted to Christianity. And in that um, conversion, it was, and, and this is the way it is with any conversion, conversion and a acceptance of Jesus Christ as their Savior always goes back to an individual choice. It is not a family choice. It's not a, a, a group choice. It's your choice. Nobody can make that choice for you. Nobody can do that for you. It has to be you. We do see in, in the book of Acts where there are people that whole households were saved. But each one of those people in that household had to make a decision. So as we read in our text, and we're going to read uh, uh, looking at the, the spouse winning conduct. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, it says, Likewise, you wives... 
be uh, in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the, con the conversation of their wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adoring, let it not be that outward adoring of plated, plating of hair and wearing of gold and the putting on of apparel. Uh, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of meekness and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this matter... In the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with uh, are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God, or the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And as we see here, Peter, he's commanding, he commanded the believers to live a God-honoring life so that they would be able to win their spouse. And many times in the first church there, what you would find in even as the church began to go in different areas, they began to go, uh, and as you see the book of First Peter, these were the Christians that were spread out throughout, uh, and it named off like, like 16 or 17 different uh, areas that they went to, and some of those were cities, and some of those were areas, and there were all these different places. And so as the church spread, and as the gospel spread to these different areas, it was very common for say, a husband to be saved and the wife not be saved, or the wife be saved and the husband not be saved. And as you would understand what's going on in this situation, they're not coming from a Christian background. Like here in what we have in America, you may have a husband and a wife, and one of them's lost and one of them's saved, and, and, but one of them, the one that's lost, they have been around Christianity all their life. They've been around these things all their life, and so they don't necessarily have another god that they are worshiping but in this situation of where peter's writing these people were one from something else they were one from paganism they were one from judaism they were one from uh, agnosticism they were one from something else so whenever one of the per one of the spouses would be saved they would be saved out of something else they've left paganism they've left the the multiple gods of the romans they've left uh, the the Judaism legalistic ways of trying to reach God or being accepted by God because of their heritage and their uh, flesh bloodline. They have gotten past that and they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. But in that situation, the other spouse may not have come to Christ. And you can imagine that you've come to a point in your life where you have realized that you were a sinner against God. You were against God. You were ungodly. There's nothing that you could do, but Christ died on the cross for you, and if you'll just put your faith in him, you will be saved. That is a great relief, that all of a sudden, all the things that I put my faith in, everything that I've been looking for, trying to be right with God, what I find is God's forgiven me, and you want to share that. Anybody that is a child of God that experienced the wonderful grace of God that doesn't want to share that, uh, it makes you wonder, hey, do they ever have Christ in their life at all? But put yourself in their shoes. And even in this, maybe you are in, the, in, in this situation where your spouse is not a Christian. How do you win them? How do you go about this? How do you become, how do you, as a wife, if you think about this, and this is a common thing that we find, how do you as a wife, how do you win your husband without constantly bashing the Bible over his head or constantly griping or constantly trying to get him in church and maybe you don't see it as griping, but he sees it that way. Or maybe you are uh, the husband and you're trying to bring your wife in the, into church, you're trying to bring her to Christ. Here's some, here are the ways that we can do this. Now, as we look at this, we have to understand 
Everybody has to make that choice. But here's the best way to win them. Here's the attitude, the actions, the conduct of a person that is going to be most likely to win their spouse. And he starts out with the, the, um, the conduct of the wife. As you look, you see, it looks like it's uh, lopsided. You see verses 1 through 6 is dealing with the wife. And then in, in verse 7, there's just this little bit about the husband. But as you would understand a little bit about the culture, especially the culture 100 years ago is completely different than it is today. But you go back in the time of, of Peter's time, women um, really didn't have a say. Um, they did not have land. They did not have property. They depended upon the husband. And the husband and wife relationship in this time frame was very much different from the husband and wife relationship that we have today. That husband and wife relationship was the wife was more, she was just as much of a servant as anybody else. There was not a marriage, the idea of marriage for love. There was not this idea that they married for. Uh, the wife was the sole purpose of passing on the heir and taking care of things at home. So put yourself and understand that situation. If you are to your husband, all you are is the person that produces my heir and takes care of my house, how are you going to win that man to Christ? Or maybe you are in a situation today, here we are today, we are very much different, and um, the culture today, women have just as many rights as the men, and there is very, it would be very easy for you to go out and take care of yourself without your husband. And, and just be honest with you ladies, we, un, we guys understand most of the time uh, you could do a lot better without us because you wouldn't have as much work to clean up the stall with us. But as we see what's going on here, we have the opportunity, and ladies, there's an opportunity, even in today's culture, there's a way to win your husband for Christ. And in, even in this day where there's this equal, um, the understanding and of uh, the equal, we're equals. That's always been true. God's always, when, Adam, when God uh, created Adam and he created Eve, Adam was created first, and then Eve was created from him. But they were always equals. They are always together, joined together. But even today, as we have this opportunity, there is a way to be different. Here's what the things you're going to find about Christians. We are called to be different. And so as we look at our text, the conduct of the wife is to be, uh, starts out with, Submission. As you see here, likewise, wives, subject yourselves, be in subjection uh, to your own husband, that if uh, any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversations of the wife. And so as we look at what's going on here, he's telling them to be in subjection. As it starts out, likewise, in verse 3, the very first word, he says, likewise, wives be in subjection to uh, your husbands. What he has been talking about in chapter 2, he's been talking about uh, a slave being in subjection to the master. Likewise, wives be in, sub in subjection to your husbands. That's not popular. The world does not like that. But ladies, if you're a child of God, I want you to understand something. We're not trying to win and please the world. We're trying to win our husband for Christ. You're trying to please Christ. And that man that you have given your life to, that you have married to, that you are married to, it, he is priority number one in the evangelism. Bringing people to Christ. You want to bring him to Christ. And so therefore, you need to be different. And it's all for the honor and the glory of God. We want them to be with us in heaven. And so we see submission, and the first thing that we should be submissive to, if we're going to do this, it starts out with a submission to Christ. We will not be good spouses if we do not first submit to Christ. And that's one thing that Peter is bringing out, is first of all, before all things, we need to be in submission to Christ. But then be in submission to your husbands. And, and what you're going to find, ladies, 
uh, is when you submit yourselves to your husbands, and especially if you've never really been the submissive type, you've always been the the, the very strong-willed, the very uh, uh, dominating type of personality, a, a act of submission is going to get his attention. And it's going to, it may not catch it right off guard, but he's going to be a little bit leery, and it may take years for this to happen. But as we, as ladies, as you submit to your husbands, your goal is so that, as it talks about in verse three or verse one, so that if he will not hear the word, if he will not listen to the word, now that word is the scriptures, the gospel. If he won't hear it, that you may, without a word, without speaking, convince him with the way that you live, your conversation, that's your life, that you may win your husband with a submissive lifestyle. A submissive attitude. This is not saying that your husband's better than you. It's not saying that he's more important than you. But his salvation is more important than your attitude. His salvation is more important than your freedom. His salvation is so important that you're willing to submit your life to him so that he might learn and come to know Christ as his Savior. But not only do you find that, but you find also that there needs to be a meek and a quiet spirit. As you see, as it tar starts talking about, and a lot of people go crazy over verse 3 where it talks about the plaiting of the hair and the wearing of gold and the putting on apparel. Ladies, what he's talking about, he's not forbidding you from dressing up. He's not forbidding you from fixing your hair. He's not forbidding you from wearing uh, jewelry. He's not forbidding you from wearing makeup or whatever else that you do to make yourself appealing. But what Peter is really getting down to is the attitude that you carry. What comes out of the heart is more beautiful than anything that there is ever will be. And here's one thing, ladies, I, I don't mean to be ugly or brunt about it, but what you're going to find is uh, it doesn't matter how physically beautiful you are, if you're uh, hard to get along with, nobody wants to look at you. So here's what Peter brings out. Let the hidden man, let, let that in, inward person, let the, the person, let the heart shine. And it's not your heart. It's the heart of Christ. As a child of God, if you put your faith in, in Christ, ladies, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, there's something new in you. There's that new birth. And what's going to be coming and changing is you have the, the, the ability to control that attitude. Say before you were a child of God, you, you were pretty sharp tongue. You were pretty uh, belligerent about things. And you say, well, I've got an attitude. That's just me. Well, Christ and Peter is calling for us to repent of that attitude, to uh, get rid of that attitude, to control that attitude, and let the attitude of Christ come out in us. If you look through the life of Christ, Christ, you think about Christ. Christ is God. But yet when he walked on this earth, he submitted himself to the authorities. He submitted himself to man. He submitted himself to everything. And so as we find what's going on here, he submitted so that he could win people. And when he went to the cross, he submitted to the cross so that he would be able to save people. So ladies, let that nature of Christ live in your life. Adorn yourself with a, as it says in verse 4, uh, with a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. God is pleased with a lady who's going to live in a quiet, in a meek, in a humble life. And one thing you're going to find in this situation is, especially if you were to look at the culture, these men were not easy to get along with. You think your man's hard to get along with. These men, and especially in this time, maybe not necessarily in Peter's area, but in the Roman culture, uh, he could have you put to death if he wanted to. So in this situation right here, he's telling them to submit themselves and have that beautiful spirit, a beautiful attitude that will win your husband. Ladies, this world is full of women. It's full of women that will talk and do whatever they want to, live however they want to, 
But if you're going to live for Christ, it needs to be different. It needs to be an attitude of submission. And you can control that if you're a child of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the last thing that we see as, as we look at what's going on here, we find respect. Uh, I, I've had people, um, a dear friend of mine at the church I pastored in Jonesboro, he uh, was told his wife, he was reading through here, and he said, you need to call me Lord. And she said, I ain't doing it. And, and, of course, they were just laughing and joking about this. But you see where it talks about in verse 6 that, that Sarah, she called Abraham Lord. Now, does that mean you got to go around calling your husband Lord? No. But the, the, the what we see here is it's an attitude of respect. She was not calling Abraham Lord as in Yahweh or Jehovah. She was calling him Lord as in the one that has authority over her, one that has is her master, and a respect for the head, the head of the household. So, ladies, as you want to win your husband to Christ, if you are uh, have a lost husband, the greatest thing that you can do, even if your husband is not lost, even if he's a child of God, you want you want to uh, encourage him to be a stronger uh, Christian, a stronger leader. Respect him. Show him respect. Encourage him. And, and, and move him with respect. You see, one of the greatest needs of a man is that he finds respect. You know, as men, as we go to work, as we go to uh, wherever it is we do, whether it's playing ball or it's fishing or uh, hunting or whatever it is, one of the greatest needs that we have as men is respect. We want to be respected at work. We want to be respected if we're playing uh, a sport. We want to be respected in whatever it is that we do. And the, the, the place where we should find respect the most is at home. And ladies, it's so important for you to show respect to your husband. Don't mock him. Don't belittle him. Don't treat him as if he's an idiot. You see our society, as you look on many TV shows, they have the dad as being an idiot. And it should not be that way in the household of a Christian woman. Because your desire is to win him for Christ. And if you show him respect, even if he's not doing godly things, it, it, respect. Here's the thing about respect in a Christian uh, mindset, a Christian attitude of respect. Respect is not earned, respect is given because you have been received, you have received mercy from God. We give respect. Ladies, give respect even if he has not earned it because your desire is to bring glory to God through him accepting Christ. But as we go on, that's the, that's the conduct of the wife. But here's the conduct of the husband. And as you look at verse 7, verse 7 starts out with the same thing. Likewise. See verse 3? Likewise. It's talking about being under submission. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, uh, giving honor to the wife of the as the uh, unto the weaker vessel, and be and being heirs together with the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So, as we see here, the conduct of the husband, as it talks about, likewise, uh, as you follow the theme, we're trying to win the spouse. So, likewise, husbands, if your if you have accepted Christ as your Savior and your wife has not accepted, you are to be different. Likewise, try to win them. Likewise, be in submission to Christ in caring for your wife. You know, a husband, uh, when we understand the role of the family in the biblical way of looking at things and the godly way of looking at things, the husband is the authority over the family. But yet he still needs to submit. He needs to submit to God, and he needs to submit to God in, in caring for his wife. You can find in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm not going to go there, but Paul is talking about how that the husband should give his life for his wife, the same way that Christ gave his life for his church. 
And so as we see here, likewise, husbands, be diligent about being different so that you may win your spouse. And as you go on and you see as it talks about, he says, likewise, husbands, dwell with, your, with, dwell with them, talking about the wife, Dwell with your wife according to knowledge. There is something so important about the knowledge part. As, as men, we, we, we need that respect. But for women, they need love. And it's a not just this uh, flowers and candy kind of romantic kind of love, but a love that you're willing to listen to their needs. You're willing to listen to what they have to say. And, and I know, guys, this is so in, it's so hard for us because typically, guys, we are not the greatest listeners. Um, and if you're like me, there's, there's only one thing you can do at a time. And if you're looking at your phone or watching TV, you have no idea what she's saying. So, love her and, and dwell with her according to knowledge. Get to know her. Get to know how to serve her. Uh, and, and that's a, a strange thing we say, serve her. I thought we were, she was supposed to be serving us. Figure out a way to help her. Figure out a way to make life better for her. Figure out a way. And this would have been drastically different from the, the culture of when Peter was writing here. And so much to the point that the wife would have been looking up at her husband when he come and listened to what she had going on that day and he listened to her what's going on in her life and he actually paid attention to what she says and he's looking for a way to help her, she would have automatically have said, what in the world is going on here? And that may, that may be the result in your house, husbands. Uh, men, it may be the same result in your life that you have neglected your wife to the point where uh, maybe even if you did start trying to tell her about Christ and about the gospel, maybe you've just become a Christian, maybe you've been a Christian a long time and your wife is not a Christian, maybe you've neglected her so long that the point where you start trying to tell her about Christ, it ain't going to work. But it can work if you do Love her and dwell with her according to knowledge. Get to know her. Spend time with her. Uh, figure out what she needs. There are everything. Uh, guys, we all understand this. Every woman's different. But then again, every woman has the same needs. Uh, and what you're going to find is she needs something from you. It might be different, but she needs something from you, and you need to spend the time to know her so that you might help in that need. But not only that, but you see also it says, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now that does not mean that that woman is, um, what it, here's what it means. She's physically weaker than you. Uh, it is a biological understood um, scientific thing that we find. Observe nature. Typically, in everything that you find in nature, the male is always the strong and dominant one. Whether, whether you be talking about um, uh, dogs or bulls or, or whatever it is. And the humans, the way that God made it, humans, God made Adam, he's the worker, and he made Eve to help the worker. But he says, give honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. Understand, she's not your slave. Understand, she's not just to do everything that you want her to do. But look at her as someone that needs your help. Someone that needs you in their life. And you honor that. You don't hold, you don't hold it over her as if somehow I'm stronger than you, I'm better than you. Uh, because guys, we can if we're all honest with ourselves, our wives are, are way better than we, what we deserve. But not only that, uh, our wives, they're smart, they're worth listening to. But show honor to her. Don't just make her, don't just dismiss her. Show honor to her. The last thing that we see here is he talks about being heirs together of the grace of life. This week as I was looking through this, as you see the part where it says in the first part of 7, it says likewise. He's trying to win. Now, why would he bring out this grace of life? 
join uh, the heirs of grace of life. It's not necessarily talking about that they're saved people and they're joint heirs and salvation, but the grace of life is part of the blessings that you find, and it goes back to, to the very first chapter of the book, uh, the first, um, I think it's Genesis chapter 2, where God looked and he saw that Adam, he created all these animals and he created all these things and they all had their mate. And he looked at, and the first time that God ever said something was not good is when he looked at man and he saw that he did not have a helper. He did not have a help meet. And he says, it's not good. So the grace of life is God created someone to help the man. And that is the wife. And so the grace of life here is as you can see here, that both of you have received the grace of life in the part where God has brought you together. He's allowed you to be up together and live life together. And so as we see, as it talks about here, he says, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. It's talking about that, that intimate relationship, that intimacy that you have. You're trying to win her. And so... What we're going to see is there needs to be that intimacy. There needs to be that, and we're not just talking about a, a, a sex life. We're talking about the relationship. We're talking about a close relationship. What you're going to find is what Peter is bringing out is to win her as the friend. I, I, my wife is my best friend. And if you've been through life, you, anybody that's had life uh, after high school, you pretty much figure out that your best friend in high school, you may keep up with them, but there's going to come a point in, li in life where you, you move on, they move on, you go somewhere else, but you take your family with you. And husbands... You need to have that time with your wife. She needs to be your best friend. And you need to treat her better than your best friend. And so as we see here, this grace of life, and if you don't do that, if you don't love and respect her and treat her and honor her and know her and, and just have that intimate time where you and her have that conversation and just talk and just, just share with a life with them, if you don't have that, it hinders your prayers. If you don't respect her and love her the way that, that we should, it's going to hinder your prayer. And when, when we think about the prayer, the greatest prayer that you have, if, you're, if your spouse is not a child of God, the greatest prayer that you have is for them to be saved. So one of the things that you're going to find is if you're not living according to what Peter says here, then you're hindering the prayers of their salvation. You're hindering the prayers where they can be, that they will accept Christ as their Savior. You're hindering that. And the last thing that you want to do is to have, the last thing for me as a child of God, the last thing I ever want to have in my life is that I go to heaven and my spouse doesn't. Is that I go to be with Christ and forgiven of my sins and my wife goes to hell. So for me to live according to this way, wives, live in submission to your husbands, love them, respect them, have a good attitude. Husbands, be good to your wives, know her, spend time with her, uh, grow that bond together for the purpose of not only having a good marriage, but for the purpose that that spouse will be with you in eternity. Not just with you, but with God. For eternity. See, it doesn't matter how effective that you are as evangelism. If you don't start at home, it's not going to work anywhere else. So folks, live a life that's going to win your spouse. That's the most important person that you have to win right now. If, you're, if your spouse is not a Christian, that is the most important right there. That's your mission field. That's your mission work. And live according to this. This might be the penning, the words that Peter penned, but they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they will work if you will follow them. 
pray for them, live, and it may take years. But remember, God's word always works. And but there's also one thing we got to understand too. They've got to make up their mind. But you can do your part. And then let them take care of their part. Folks, I thank you for listening. If you've got any comments or questions, you send us a um, text or you send the uh, language or the website or the Facebook page. Send us a message on there and myself, Duster, and Logan will respond to you. We want to be able to help as much as we can if it's nothing else other than just simply having time of prayer. And folks, let's not forget how important that is. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your blessings, Lord. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray for this word to not be just something that we've, we've heard, but Lord, that we take your word and we apply it. Lord, I pray for the ones that have... Uh, spouses or uh, loved ones that have not accepted you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that they will see this as an encouragement, but that not only an encouragement, that they will be dedicated to live um, the way that your word has uh, given them, uh, the instructions that they have given them, and Lord, that they may be effective soul winners at home. And Lord, we thank you for your blessings, and we thank you that you provided for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.